forth a number of truths that just fly in the face of logic, of human wisdom, of political expediency, of the expectations of the people of their time. And in the midst of this, so one of the echoing words over and over is, blessed, blessed, blessed are you. Some versions say happy, and as you learned last week, Pastor Harris, I believe my wife said, explain what, it, what, what does it mean to be blessed. So we're going to look at that this morning. I read a story in a Jewish book today where the teacher took his students out in Israel, took them out into the desert. And he, and he talked about the blessings of God that are all around. And he, he took some cups, and he had one cup that was facing up, and one cup he put down. And he said, there's a God who just desires to pour out his blessings. And he's pouring them out on the whole world. And he just pours, and he 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 pours. And, he pours. and at the end, he asks, who was blessed? God didn't stop blessing. He poured out his blessings everywhere. They were there and abundant for the whole world to receive, but this person got nothing. But this one is full. Why? Because they were in a position and a place to receive. One of the sayings I drive my kids crazy with is about what success is, and we could substitute the word blast. And I've always said success is being where God wants you to be, doing what God has called you to do at the right time and with the right attitude. We focus on the first two parts because that's critical because so many people are not where God wants them to be and they're not doing what God's called them to do. They're missing out on the biggest part of God's plan for their life. And even if you happen to find those two things, which is rare, I would say 80% of the church has missed that. They miss the calling of God in their life, and, and they're trying to ask God to bless what they're doing instead of doing what God's called them to do and then be blessed. It took me 20 years to sort that out. And if you get to that place where you are open and ready to do what God has called you to do, you're going to be blessed. So we've been looking through a number of, of things in, in our study, and uh one of the things, that, particularly when I guest speak at churches, is I, I love the PowerPoint. I become over-dependent on it. But I love live pictures because so many of our kids, 30 and under today, are being told the Bible is full of myths and fables and stories and mythology. And it's not real. This story is at a real place that is still there today, an over, uh, overhead shot of the Sea of Galilee, and one of the many coves that are just outside Capernaum, a real place that I got to stand at, and you can, you can see it from another view from the ocean, it forms a perfect amphitheater where Jesus, when he called his disciples, and he sat in a boat and taught, or he sat in a mountain and taught, uh, like we'll go to the mountain others, the acoustics are just perfect. Our teacher stood on the beach, and we as students walked up that hill further and further at the top of the hill as a Catholic church, the, 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 the Church of the Beatitudes, because they mark locations that they are like 99% sure. Within a few hundred yards, this is right where Jesus was. It's a real place with a real sermon, the greatest sermon ever given by the greatest preacher who ever lived, and, and it only takes about two minutes to read, and yet... Man, the wisdom that is involved in this. So let's kind of look through that. Always, always when I do a sermon, I like to look at the time and the setting, the place, the main people. We have a number of characters that are involved in this story as the multitudes were following Jesus. And, and, and not to lose track at how radical this message was, you've got Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and the Zealots. Well, what is the difference between those? The Pharisees, kind of shown in this picture here, religious garb, the law of God on their foreheads, had not only an understanding and wisdom and training in the law, but had written volumes, encyclopedias on things to keep you from reading the law. But eventually those traditions became higher than the law. And they thought that they had, had it made, they did it right, they washed their hands correctly, they knew what to eat, where to go, how far to walk, what to do, and crazy stuff. The Sadducees had kind of given up on that. In fact, they kind of gave up on a lot of the spiritual things. The classic joke is they denied the resurrection, which is not a joke, but they were sad, you see, because they didn't see any life outside of this. 
So they became very carnal, very much living for today. Then the Essenes, John the Baptist, was, was more like the Amish crowd, right? Let's escape, let's get away from the crowd, let's go out in the wilderness and just hunker down. You know, that, uh, what do they call the, uh, the people who have the uh, little fortresses underground? And, uh, the doomsday or the survivor folks, right? We're just going to get out of here and hope the Romans, whatever. someday it'll settle out and someday that kingdom will come. And then there's the zealots, the Tea Party people, that are going to say, no, let's do this now. Let's take on those Romans. We got a sword. We can do this. Let's fight. Four incredibly different groups. And you look at what Jesus is saying in this sermon and how that would impact these people. It's going to make it even more alive to you. Now, this is kind of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He had been baptized by John, the baptizer, the Baptist. He had gone out into the desert and faced the devil and, and won by saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And full of the Spirit, he comes back and he begins to preach in 417. His first message is, one word, repent. Repent! Repent! Not a popular message today. Knock it off. Turn around. Stop doing the stupid stuff. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of life. Repent for the kingdom of God. A phrase that's 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of God is near. It's here. It's at hand. And that sets the setting as the crowns start to come. And we get to Matthew 5 too. It says Jesus saw. He saw the crowds. He sat down, something that was traditional for the rabbis, but not the priest in the temple, right? There's a lot of theology about sitting down and, and the work being done. And it says, opening his mouth, he said. He saw, he sat, and he said. And we've kind of just laid that out for you, kind of picture that setting as we get into the message. What we've learned so far is that these beatitudes, these teachings of Jesus are not only incredibly powerful, but there is a progression to them. The poor in spirit are those who recognize, I'm not adequate. I, I, I can't do it. I am not good enough. I am not perfect. And, 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 and the Pharisees who really thought they had it all together, what a slap in the face to them. Because they were poor in spirit. They were pretty haughty and said, yeah, we, we've got it. We've got it together. So the very first one is a slap to a major religious group but he says, those who recognize their inadequacy, man, theirs is the kingdom of God. A phrase that will be repeated at the end. He sandwiches these blessings together. It's going to begin with the kingdom of God. It's going to end with the kingdom of God. And it's, blessed are those who mourn. Those who are sad over the things that God is sad about. One of the prayers of the song, I think, in the 80s or 90s, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Yeah, that, think about that. Where today, many times, we're rejoicing at the things God calls evil. We call evil good and good evil. We are not sad over it. We are flaunting it in God's face. But that's a good prayer. That's a good prayer, folks. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Make me sensitive to sin. Or and the, the positive side is, Lord, help me to love what you love. What you love, and maybe even who you love. Particularly us as a church, as we reach out to so many needy folks in diverse groups, man, we need to love these people the way that God does. And we can't until we know how much God loves us. And then the meekness, I'm not sure who spoke when the meekness, but that, that whole idea of breaking a horse, it comes from that idea. Is the horse any less strong after that breaking process? No, it's still a strong, powerful horse, but it's strength under control. It's those who are submitting their strength to God's strength and being open and sensitive. So what happens to those who recognize their insufficiency? There is just a kingdom of heaven. For those who really mourn, they're going to be comforted. And for those who submit their strength and power and say, Lord, I, I've got some, but I'm giving it to you, they shall inherit the kingdom or the earth. They and, and Tony Evans did a message on that. He said, basically, it's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You inherit the earth, the kingdom of God. Your blessings can be yours today. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. Heaven is here. The kingdom is here. Wherever the king is, there's an aspect of the kingdom that is there for us to enjoy. So Amen. That's, that's kind of, that's good stuff right there. That's kind of where we've been the last few weeks. So what, what, what do we need to know? Know your need. 
You need a Savior. You need someone that's better than you. You're not good enough. Then know your heart. Know God's heart. And know who is in charge. That's all review. So as we get into our verse today, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. What does it mean to be blessed? You got the commercials, right? I got, I got it in the paper this week. I got my folder. $7,000 a week for life. Man, what a blessing that would be, right? Then you look at the odds. <laughs> you, I won't even get into the odds of you getting the virus, but it's, a, it's probably higher or less than getting the odds of becoming the winner for life. Are they blessed? We've done studies. I've mentioned this before. The top 10 winners of the lottery said it was the worst thing that ever happened to them. They lost marriages, some lost lives, some lost health, some had to move, families turned on them, friends turned on them. It was the worst thing. And nine out of ten ended up worse financially five years later. Crazy. And we think if we just had this, what would it take to make you happy or blessed? And we'll look at that again. Just what does that mean? Some have titled the sermon, The Constitution of the Kingdom, and they even see it as, these are the rules for the millennial kingdom. And there's certainly an element of truth there. I like this, the manifesto of the monarch. Because the, the heart of, of the gospel of Matthew is stressing the kingship, the monarch. Jesus is king. Uh, but I made this one up myself. It's the formula for the fortunate. It's a recipe for rewards. There is an element of this message that is true for us today. Not in the millennial kingdom. Stuff for us today... It can't totally be for the millennium because the one I'm going to preach on next on Easter Sunday is blessed are those who are persecuted. Is there persecuted persecution in the kingdom? I don't think so. It wouldn't be the kingdom. So there's an element there that, that we need to see. But as I did the word study on, blessed, on the word blessed, and, and I know you got some of that last week, the word I thought that kind of summarized it best is fortunate. A little different than being happy. There's an element of contentment there, there is uh, that favor of God, a little extra bonus goodness that is ours today. You get the parking spot, things open up. And here's the phrase, things will go well with you. Not without a problem, but overall, things will go well with you. That's what it means to be blessed. So we're going to keep going and see how, how does that relate to this? Our, our key words, blessed, right? Fortunate are those who hunger and thirst. So what's the hungriest you've ever been? Hmm. I don't know if any of you have ever fasted the longest. One of my comedy buddies just did a 40-day fast. I, I, I just, just juices. Just juices. Uh, I, I, I go on a couple days, and I'm telling you what, after the third day, you can smell french fries for five miles. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that cereal box calls you out of the cupboard. There's things that... It's amazing. Now they say, they say those hunger pains will leave after three or four days. Your stomach kind of adjusts. I never found that. <laughs> I haven't found that. But it, it is one of the keys to developing a hunger for God is to deny your physical hunger and replace it with something spiritual. You want to say, well, really, I'm not hungry for God. We just sang, seek ye first the kingdom of God. As the deer pants with her, so my soul longs after you. Does your soul long after God? Can you not wait to get here? Are you upset? Some of the people on the one line that you couldn't come to church today, man. Man, I, 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 I want to be in church. I want to be with the people. If I can't be here and I'm trapped, I still want to be with God's people. And I mean, there, there's a part of that. But I, I just read a story on Valley Forge again and how desperately hungry, how many hundreds of men died for hunger in Valley Forge in that battle under George Washington, where they were boiling some of the leather off their shoes and trying just to drink something for taste. They were chewing on strips of their tent. They were just desperate for food, and some of the food that got delivered was spoiled, and they were so hungry they ate it anyway. What's the hungriest you've ever been? What, what do you just like to eat? What are you in the mood for? It's one of my only complaints with my wife. She's almost perfect. Almost perfect. But when we go out to dinner which is rare, I know what I want. I know what I want before I even get there. I sit down, got the menu, don't need the menu. All right? Outback, Victoria Cut, crab cake on the side, crab, oh, just, I'm done. And my wife is like, hmm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's like the waitress, are you ready? And they'll come back and, no, 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 don't come back. Stay, 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 come on, pick something, pick something. <laughs> what is it that we want? 
Food is one thing, but what does this world want that thinks it's going to bring happiness? Is it status? Is it success in a job? Is it some sex or some high? Is it power, prestige? Is it, you know, there's things that we pursue. If we think we get them, we're going to be happy. We are craving after all kinds of things in this world. Now, this week I got to speak with Romeo Scott. She was in Buffy the Vampire for three years. I never watched. Never watched Buffy the Vampire. She was the dancer with Prince for five years. Traveled the world with Prince. And now she's the lead actress in this movie Unplanned, which my family watched just the other week. She shared in her story at the peak of her success, where she was making tens of thousands of dollars a day, doing modeling, doing dancing, traveling the world, had the fame, had the house, had the money, had everything, that she was battling a series of addictions. Food being one of them. Anorexic, bulimic, food disorders, other drug addictions, trying to keep the energy, trying to look good, trying to do this, trying to do that, and, and ended up going bankrupt financially because of all the stuff that she was into, and morally bankrupt, and every other way bankrupt. At a time you think, this 30-year-old has it all together. And all. No, she said it was the emptiest she had ever been. There are things we just sang, only you can satisfy. And yet we're still so tempted by that publisher clearing house. If we just had this, if I could just do that, the crazy stuff. I love the commercials on stickers. I love the commercials. From Betty White to Mr. T to the biker gang, they always have the one the Brady Bunch might be the best one ever. Marsha, 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 the guy's there. That's here. Eat a Snickers. And then what? One bite, and what happens? They change. One bite, and they change. And what's, what's the catchphrase? Well, well, that's not the catchphrase at the bottom. You're better with a Snickers. You're not yourself when you're hungry. As soon as they take a bite, the question in every commercial is, better? Better? And, and, and I love that whole idea of Snickers, but it, will that really change our life? Will Snickers change our life? It might give us a moment or two of pleasure. So I think of hunger still the most moving thing in my life, but it was in, in joy. It's great that joy is here. Uh, she, she was part of the serving of that for two years with us, but to be in the Dominican at the dump waiting for the garbage trucks with this group of Haitian refugees that just wait for the garbage truck to dump so all these kids run and dig through the trash looking for something to eat. And when we started eight years ago, they were getting one meal a week. We took peanut butter sandwiches uh, and, and a cup of cold water, the name of the ministry, Cups of Cold Water. Now we're up to five days a week. They get vitamin and rich soup, they get a peanut butter sandwich, and they get uh, as much fresh water so they don't have to walk the two, three miles down through the jungle to the creek to fill up their bottles that they picked out of here so they would have something to drink. I, I can't imagine, I've never been that hungry to go through the garbage and get stuff and put it in a pot where they have to cook it to try to get the germs out. But, but we say, as the deer pants for the water, as the deer, so my soul longs after you. Are you hungry for God? I am a part of the ministry too. Where did I put my cup here? Yeah, humankind ministry. I was with uh, T.J. Fultz when he started this ministry. The, the number of thousands of kids who will die today for the lack of clean water. It's not political. It's not financial. It doesn't take much to buy a filter. It doesn't take much to drill a well. And what they're doing around the world. He invented this product, humankind water. Every time you buy a bottle, a kid drinks water for free for a year. And it's in uh, Walmart. It won the best new product eight years ago. And... Uh, it's still going strong out of Philadelphia. Humankind order. And, and, and our, our verse next says, hunger and thirst. Now, I, the first kiss I've ever been was back when we played football. When I, I wasn't that big, I wasn't that good. But we did those two-a-days, and it seemed like every day was 100 degrees. And back in those days, back in my day, we didn't have Gatorade. We did, in fact, we weren't allowed to drink during practice, because if you drank, you were a wuss. <laughs> you got to toughen up, put a pebble in your mouth. Just put some, and, and people would be passing out left and right, and the coach is like, we're going to make a man. And that, how stupid is that? <laughs> now, my goodness, you see these players in the NFL? they got people squeeze. They can't even squeeze water in their own mouth. That drives me nuts. they got people come up, and they squirt in your mouth. They uh, uh, can't squirt. Everything wrong, one play, they come out for a break, and they got an oxygen tank on them. What is that? <laughs> They're getting 20 million bucks, and they can't even squirt their own water. But 
thirst. Thirst, man, that, that'll drive. There was a story about a battle in World War II in the northern parts of Africa where, where the, the enemy was, was on retreat and the army kept going and going and they outran their supplies and now they're stuck in the desert. And these guys are thirsty. And they pursued the enemy, pursued the enemy. Finally, they, they overcame and there was a supply of water. And the commander gave them order, no one is to drink until all the wounded and the sick are, are, are given drinks first. And it said it took four hours. All the other troops had to stand and wait. The water was right there. They had been through three days in the desert. They were just completely parched. Their lips are dry and cracked. And there's the water, but they had to wait for the wounded and the weary to be taken care of first. Can you imagine that longing, that longing that's there? Are you that thirsty for God? So we need to have a hunger and thirst. One of my favorite places to go is the Ocean City Boardwalk. We do it with our kids every year. And what we do, especially with all our kids, is to go to the fudge place. Why? What do they do at the fudge place? Somebody is standing outside <laughs> with a little square of temptation. And you walk by and you think, oh, I'll just take a free sample, take a free sample, take a free sample. <laughs> How many take four or five? Oh, that was pretty good. Maybe, maybe, can I go back in? We always end up buying a pound or buying something on there. Because that little sample was something good. The Bible, Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, I'm not really hungry for God. Well, give him a chance. Get a little sample. Ask him to reveal his presence in your life. Get to see God work in your life a little bit, and you're going to want more. Yeah, you're not, you're, oh man, that's good stuff. So we need the hunger and we need the thirst. But what is it that we're hungry for? Is it status? Is it success? Is it some, some experience of stuff? And the word here says righteousness. Of all the things in this world that we see on TV and others, who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness? The simplest elementary definition is to be right with God. To get right with God, the Old Testament often exchanged with the word salvation. Noah was a righteous man. That phrase is used. And, and the idea is that there is a right standard, which means there's a right and a wrong. In a society that doesn't want to believe there's a right and wrong anymore, there is a standard. And to hunger and thirst to be right with God mm -hmm. is an important thing. And many people see it in the law. When I was doing more construction, I love... The old EE -E questions. Do you remember the EE -E questions? Evangelism explosion. People would wear two little question marks and people say, what is that on there? Two questions. Oh, it's the two most important questions in life. So what are those questions? If you were to die today, do you know if you would go to heaven? That's a pretty good question. And most people I talked to said, I think so, I hope so. Hmm. But you know, you can know for sure. In fact, they always come up with this scenario. If there was a hurricane, if there was an earthquake, if a big tree fell on the church and we were all killed, and right now you're standing before God, and he says, why should I let you in? What would you say? And one-on-one, -on -one, you get to find out what people really believe. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I've never killed anyone. I'm better than my neighbor. And, and I've had more than my share of folks, particularly South Philly, Irish, Italian, hey, coming up on... St. Patty's Day, right? And, and, and they would say, I keep the Ten Commandments. That's incredible. If you could keep the Ten Commandments, if you could do that, that's pretty awesome. So what did I always say? Can you name them? <laughs> I probably asked that question 10,000 times. I've never met anyone that could name more than three or four. So let me help you with that. You keep the Ten Commandments. Is God always first in your life? There's no other gods before you? You're 0 for 1. I know you take the Lord's name in vain. I've been working with you this morning. You're over too. I know you lust after women. You just broke 8, 9, and 10. Because I heard what you said to the girl walking down the street. I know what you talked about your parents. You're not honoring your mother and father. Were you in church last week? Oh, you just broke number 4. In fact, you're 0 for 6, 0 for 7, 0 for 8, 0 for 9. I mean, which, which ones do you keep? You said you keep the Ten Commandments? None of us can keep the Ten Commandments. Maybe one day we can keep four out of five or six out of ten. Or, but overall, we have all sinned, haven't we? And the law is there to show us that we are not perfect. So we are not righteous. And, and if we break it down in the New Testament, righteousness is both a position 
that we are declared righteous, and it's a practice that I should be doing the right things. Now, we just sang, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are you seeking to be right with God? And if you are right with God, are you seeking to live in a way that upholds that standard? That you, will, you don't want to do the things that Jesus had to pay for. So, let's look at the word righteousness just a few, a few minutes. Romans, to me, is still the key chapters. These are verses and passages every believer should have down pat after your first few weeks, months of, of being saved. But it, it begins, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel... The what? The what? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So there is a standard that we need to, to keep there. Then Romans 3.23 says this, there is no one, no, no. no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who even understands. And then the next six verses quote six psalms that say from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, our thought, our eyes, our words, our steps, our guidance are all wicked. Every aspect of us is prone to evil. There is not a righteous part of my body apart from God. We are not righteous. There is no one who seeks after God. All have turned away. They become together worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Well, I thought you said this was good news. The gospel's good news. Well, the good news is God still loves you. Even though you're worthless and there's nothing righteous and you have no sufficiency and there's nothing you can do that would please God. In fact, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. I don't want to get gross, but look that up in the Hebrew. <laughs> it's pretty nasty stuff what he's talking about there. It's nastiness. So... What else does it say? Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. But rather, through the law, you become conscious of your sin. You can't be good enough on your own. You'll never make that standard. And we need to come to that place where we know we're lost before we can get found. We need to know we need saving before we can understand what a great Savior we have. And here's some good news. But now, now that you know what you are, lost, condemned, undeserving, insufficient, altogether not one righteous, but now, I love the blessed buds of Scripture, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. That's all of the Old Testament. This is not a new message to the Jews. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all, all who believe. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, oh, don't stop there, all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left those sins committed before him unpunished. He didn't judge things in the past because he was going to judge it on the cross. If he didn't judge us the way we deserve, but he reveals the standard, we fall short, and then he still comes up and finds a way to make us right. And the solution is, is, is Romans 10. I didn't print out that whole text. I, I was going to read it to you. Just a few verses, and then we're going to kind of wrap this up. But it, it's just so important. These texts are so foundational. And if it's the secret to being blessed, I, I, love, I love this idea of, of the judge, where the judge is sitting there, and, and all of a sudden his son comes in. And, and, and he's found guilty of all these charges, and everyone's wondering, what's the sentence? What's the sentence? Is the judge going to be lenient because it's his son? And the judge gives him the harshest, most severe penalty of all. And everyone is stunned. And the guy says, guilty, and slams the gavel. Then the judge gets up, takes off his robe, and comes down and says, I will serve the sentence for you. That's the gospel. We are condemned apart from Christ. But the one who condemns us took our place. 
<laughs> and paid the harshest penalty, satisfying the law, satisfying the righteousness, and yet demonstrating the love of a father. It's not either or. God is loving, but he can't ignore unholiness. But he is just, and he demanded that payment, and Jesus paid it for us. That's how we become righteous. Let me read for you in Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God, is for the Israelites, that they might all be saved. For I can testify about them. Those Jews, they're zealous. They're zealous for God, but their zeal was not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. They sought to establish their own. They made up their own rules. But God sought, and, excuse me, they, did, they sought to establish their own, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. But Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Let me jump down. In verse 9, salvation verses, but see it in the context of being made right with God. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified or made right. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone, anyone, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all and richly blesses all who call on him. So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you have to know first that you're not right with God. Then you have to understand that the law can't do it. It just shows you how far short you come. But don't miss the fact that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but fulfill it. And therefore became the perfect sacrifice as we enter into this resurrection season. Why did he die? To satisfy the wrath of God, to pay the penalty you deserve and that I deserve. It's the grace of God. It's what makes it possible and we're declared not guilty. Can I summarize all that in one verse? 2 Corinthians 5.21. I love this. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus not only took on our sins, it says literally, he became sin. And his father could not bear the sight and turned his back on him. Separation from God, the penalty of what sin is. So Jesus took our sin, and we become, look at the phrase, and the the verb tenses are so important. We become a past, a past action with a continuing effect. We become the righteousness of God. He looks at us and doesn't see our sin. He looks at us and sees the righteousness of God. Man, that's hard. That is hard. And yet God does that for us. So when you understand that, you become right with God. And now you have this hunger and thirst and you want to please God because he loves you and you've tasted of his salvation, you've experienced his presence. How do you keep that hunger going? How do you keep the hunger growing? Well, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His word is called meat. His, his word is called milk. His word is called honey. Jesus said, you can't live by bread alone, but, but as we look into the word, it is one of the ways that we feed. And I love 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for what? Anyone know the next four things? For doctrine or teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God or woman of God would be adequately equipped. I, I heard a sermon on this years ago. It's written in the margin of my Bible. I've never forgot this. What is that saying? The word of God teaches you what is right, it teaches you what is not right or what is wrong. The correction is how you can get right. And then the training in what? Training in righteousness is how to stay right. That's the word of God given to you. So you get into the word and it helps you pursue the righteousness of God. 
How many people knew Deion Sanders tried to kill himself? At the height of his career, it's a good sports trivia question, by the way, and I'm giving you the answer, but you can do this online, you can do this. Who is the only guy to be in both a World Series and a Super Bowl? Bo Jackson. Deion, Deion, Deion Sanders. Uh, Bo Jackson played two sports, uh, but the only one to be in a World Series I'm and right. a Super Bowl is Deion Sanders. Sorry. What did he call himself? Neon, Neon, Neon. Yeah, Neon, that was one of his nicknames, but uh, there was another name time. I'm drawing a blank on it now. Prime time. Prime time. Thank you. There you go. Prime time. <laughs> well, I, I read the article. I read the article. At, at, at the peak of winning two awards, commercials, all kinds of endorsement deals, tens of millions of dollars, really one of the most popular athletes of his time, he was so empty that he took his car and drove off a cliff. 40 foot down, and he, when he landed, the car didn't burst into flames. And, and he, didn't, he didn't die. And he started to look around and thought, God must have spared me for a reason. And some Bible verses that his grandma had taught him started to come to mind. And somehow he walked back up that ravine and got back and, and became right with God. It's an amazing testimony that most people don't know. But my point is this, that he had what everything and everybody in the world thinks that it's going to take to be blessed, to be happy. And he said, as Muhammad Ali said in the peak of his fame, I had the whole world and it weren't nothing. I had the whole world and it weren't nothing. Emptiness is all around us. People are empty. They're not satisfied. That's our last word. Blessed is the state of being in God's favor. The hunger and thirst is this process. What do we focus on? Righteousness is the thing we seek first to be right with God positionally, and in our life. And when we are in that state, God's word in Jesus' message says we will be satisfied. Satisfied. Nick Jagger didn't have it. Uh, only one snicker of that, right? I can't get no. I can't sing, I know, but I can't get no. All right, a little bit newer. How about the kids? How about the new kids? I still haven't found... What I'm looking for. What I'm looking for. I, I looked up the lyrics of that song. I mean, I, I wrote them down. I wrote them down. Again, I, I'm not quite sure where Bono is in his name, but here's some of the lyrics. I believe in the kingdom that's come. The one who broke the bonds and loosed my chains, carried his cross and took my shame. You know I believe it. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. What's he missing? What's he missing? Where, what do we have to do to enjoy the relationship? What do we have to do to pursue? Satisfy. To be full to overflowing. You ever been to that place Thanksgiving? I've been to it, right? You get to that place, you got to unbuckle. Even my skinny little body. Sometimes i got to unbuckle. Just sit in my lazy boy. Unbuckle. Oh, Thanksgiving, well, I, can't, I couldn't eat another bite. Right, early on in marriage, my wife grew up in those where you ate everything on the plate. And every time I cleaned my plate, she put more on there. More on there. And I didn't want to disappoint her, so I kept eating. I was like, honey, stop. I can't, I can't keep doing this. But she was brought, you had to keep eating. And I was just like, no, I, I, can't, I, have, I can't leave anything. And it was like, well, I got to get this. Did you ever get to that place where you couldn't eat another bite? Shady maple? But in life, is get to the place where Paul said, I've learned to be content. I'm satisfied. I got what I need. I'm not striving. I'm not anxious. I'm not empty. I'm content. Going back old school now. Going back old school. George Beverly Shea. Yeah, there you sang go. the same song. For Billy almost Graham. every Billy Graham conference. Yep. And the song was? I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Is this true of you? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold or publisher's clearinghouse or the state lottery or what's going to happen because I'm laid off for two weeks. What am I going to do? do you, would you rather have Jesus? I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. Ooh, that's tough for a comedian. I like, I like applause. 
I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. Than to be the king of a vast domain, to be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I think that, I think that's it. So what do we need to do? Psalm 34, 8. If you haven't, taste and see. If you haven't been made right with God, maybe today, maybe today, you know, you're worried about death or worried about a virus. What would happen? I oh, don't want anyone to die. I don't want anyone to get the virus. But the truth is, someday we're all going to die of something. Mm -hmm. And when you do, are you right with God? Have you worked through that process? Do you recognize what Jesus did as we're just weeks away from celebrating is not even the right word, but remembering Good Friday and the cost that was paid for our sin. Amen. <clears throat> and the love that put him there, the love that kept him there. It's just an amazing thing. The invitation stands, Isaiah 55 said it, Jesus said it in John 7. Come unto me. If anyone be thirsty, come to me, Jesus said. And Isaiah, come to me, all who are thirsty. Why spend your money on, on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Do you remember a time when you prayed and asked God to forgive you for your sins? To begin that relationship so that you could be declared right with God from this moment on to be justified and then to commit your life with His strength and His power to live in a way that would please Him. That's what we need to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that you gave to these groups who thought they had it all together and they had to learn it wasn't enough. Your word says unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, we're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Lord, we can't even keep up with the Pharisees. We can't keep your law. We have failed. We have sinned. We have come short of your glory. But Lord, I thank you for these explanations that you who knew no sin became sin for us and that we can right now become the righteousness of God to be justified. So Lord, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness because of your blood shed on the cross. We believe the penalty has been paid. The debt has been covered. Your anger has been satisfied and you have bought us with a price. May we be like the opening illustration, cups open and ready to receive your love, your grace, your forgiveness, your righteousness, credited to our account because you died in our place. Lord, may this be a turning point for many today, that we no longer have to fear death. Whether this virus passes this week or this day, Lord, may we never fear death because you died in our place. Be our Lord. Be our Savior. Help us to be satisfied, content, that you would be our Savior, you would be our shepherd, and we shall not be in want because of all that you provide. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you that because of your righteousness and your sacrifice, things can be well with my soul. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.